so I'm delighted to put together this uh, wonderful super panel. Um, and I'm, in fact, I'll start with you, Emma, just to introduce yourself, please. Um, and then we'll take turns um, up to Caitlin. Just I feel like I just got enough of a rap from Tolga, so thank you for that. Um, my name's Emma. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Click Media. Um, we're a marketing agency that specialises in connecting brands with gaming audiences through various mediums, whether it be through creators, through building, you know, metaverse um, or gaming experiences and through events both online and offline like the tournament. Um, he just took you through. Awesome. Hi, I'm Sasha. I'm the Chief Media Officer at Hounds Logan Company. We are a full service um, advertising agency. We work with brands um, across sort of spectrum of any type of media um, as well as creative. Hi, I'm Yun Yip, Chief Commercial Officer at ION. So we are a planning and buying measurement and creative platform for all IAB gaming environments. And I'm Caitlin, you've already heard from me, um, but Caitlin from Azerian, um, who are a digital advertising and entertainment business and platform in Australia. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Um, so, we'll start with you, Sasha. We, we heard um, from Raylene actually earlier, and that was um, fantastic, around um, that concept of myth-busting. And actually, you've been on our working group, gaming, the game, gaming or adverti game advertising working group, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, since its inception, actually. And the first thing we did was some myth-busting. We told our own stories, didn't we? That was sort of the first project. So, do you, do you still feel that's something that we still need to do in order to drive education? Do we need to keep, keep that going? Yeah, it was really interesting looking at the report um, year on year. I think you're really starting to see some interesting trends, but I definitely think we've still got a myth bust. You know, more often than not, we get clients that, and not just in gaming, but more so in gaming, where they bring their own experience and their own understanding, their own consumption habits to the forefront. And so I think, you know, we have to work really, really hard, particularly around audience and who is actually there but even more so as well around brand suitability. And I think the conversation has shifted a little bit. I think it's a little bit easier and a lot more people are a lot more open to understanding that the audience is there. However, this brand suitability piece is coming up more where people sort of go, oh, I don't know if my brand can fit into this crazy gaming world um, and sort of feeling that you need to be a big FMCG brand or, you know, I think the um, New Balance industrial line is a great example where it's probably a product that you wouldn't naturally feel is a gaming contextual play. Um, so, yeah, definitely still need to keep working at it, but we're getting there slowly by slow, you know, slowly and slowly. And I think taking the report out to your clients is always a good way. Yeah. Um, and just showing them, you know, you've got to have those conversations proactively before we actually get to trying to sell something in rather than, you know, the response being like, it should be gaming, you know? Yeah, it's still, still those misconceptions do exist. Um, so, Kayleen, I know with um, Azurian you work across, um, you know, all, all formats, shapes and sizes, but how different do you feel um, gaming is versus um, sort of your standard digital programmatic? Um, what, are the, what are the nuances that, that you find most interesting? Look, I think the biggest difference is still the misconception. Um, I think the challenge that we do face is often justifying the role of gaming in a full media mix. I think though the stimulation of I think the receptivity that has been coming from marketers has certainly done a bit more of a category job for gaming I think in recent years. We will probably, I really hope to see in future, you know, the same way in which we plan for OnePlus Reach campaigns across TV networks or broadcast buys, um, gaming to form that same kind of similar planning method uh, because it does have the scale and it, because it does have the reach and it has that attention and those really good quality, solid experiences that we can expect from the likes of a TV experience. But I think, you know, we still have the biggest sort of challenge of getting people to understand the role of gaming in a media mix um, outside of talking to uniquely gamers. And I think, you know, that misconception of people identifying as a gamer and that we have to actually treat them like gamers, 
I play games, I do not identify as a gamer, but I also watch TV and I don't identify as a TV watcher. So mm -hmm. I think there's multiple kind of ways in which we can actually start to rationalise gaming in that sense of, you know, the quality that we do expect from a TV or an audio or a streaming on YouTube is the same kind of expectation and standards that we can hold, hold to gaming now um, as measured through, you know, additional partners and additional verification partners as well. So I think it answers your question. But yeah, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Very thorough. Um, look, so Emma, that Maybelline New York campaign was fantastic. Congratulations. And we heard a little bit from Tolga in terms of its in inception and how it's put together and the four levels and everything else. I'd just like to dig in a little more around the... Um, the, re the reception. I mean, we had some, we got some info from Tolga in terms of that. But do you have, do you, how was it received from your perspective? Do you have some insights into the impact of the campaign? It's very powerful. Yeah, no, it was a really powerful ca campaign, and we were, I mean, I felt really fortunate to be a part of it because I think, you know, Click has a, a roster of gaming talent, and you know, the female identifying talent that we work with through Experience this, you know, and it is, it is sort of somewhat unique to a, a particular subset, you know, gaming category, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be tackled. And I think there was, you know, there's some really great moments. There was initially seeing the comments of particularly young girls, 11, 12, 13, saying, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for bringing awareness to it. But, you know, I was sitting with Alana, uh, the Maybelline Digital Marketing Manager, the other day, and she said that she was um, actually approached by a mother who said, you know, I showed my sons this video. They, they like gaming, they play Fortnite, and I showed them this video. And I think, you know, being able to have a brand um, make an impact and actually not just look to extract value from a gaming audience, I think touched on this earlier, but actually genuinely give back to a gaming audience. And it's not only in the way that, you know, they created this safe space for women by building a custom, you know, Fortnite metaverse space um, for women to play on, but it was also about bringing to light, you know, attention where attention needed to be brought. So they were genuinely giving back to the community based on what the community had asked them to do. You know, something that Tolga um, touched on earlier was when he actually first came to me with that brief, I, gr I grabbed 20 of them in a call and I said, guys, what do you want to see from brands? What are brands doing? What are they not doing? What should they be doing? How do you want them to speak to you? So we had a, a sort of ready-made, you know, informal round table of like, you know, of, of the target audience saying, what do you genuinely want to see and how can a brand like Maybelline genuinely add value to your gaming experience? It wasn't about how do we sell mascara to your, you know, your audiences. That, that would come and they knew early on that that was a big part of it. That they knew what Maybelline's commercial, you know, um, goals were, but they also were very involved very early on in, in, in the how and how to reach these audiences in, in a way that was going to add value. And, I think with the gaming audience, you know, these guys are savvy, uh, particularly when you're looking at the sort of Gen Z and the looming Gen A, who I'm terrified of, um, you know, really. But they are so savvy and they'll call bullshit, again, excuse my French, immediately. And so I think if you were being genuine and you were genuinely adding value, you know, that that was what we saw coming back from that campaign was genuine reactions, um, yeah, to, to what we did. So it was, it was very gratifying. Yeah, really smart. And it feels like there'd be resonance beyond just that core target audience that may constantly or they may be wanting to buy those products. The resonance, particularly, you know, amongst males that may not even think of it. You've got that strong... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know Drew and Joel, who are reaction. two of our talent who are up there, like, called me after that. You know, I had to convince them to be on there. They, they didn't know whether they wanted to be a face. They didn't know how the video would turn out. You know, the hero team were amazing. I was on the phone to them constantly, you know, sort of you know, guard railing to make sure that the experience was good. And they came out afterwards, they're like, thank you so much. Like, we knew, we pay with women every day and and still, still now we feel like we're going to be stronger advocates um, with our, within our own community. So if that's not a win, you know. Yeah, I don't no, know congratulations. Um, so Yun, also on our gaming working group. Now, we are planning to put something out before Christmas around supporting um, planning ad, ad campaigns in and around um, game uh, advertising opportunities. And something that came up when we had a little chat and swap notes for this panel, which I really liked, was your um, concept around supporting clients um, in, a, in a sort of crawl, walk, run um, manner. 
So t tell us a little bit about how, how that may look. Yeah, so I think we all love, and I'm a very big fan of these big activations, right? You look at all of these brands now in The Sims, in Fortnite, in um, Roblox as an example, but there still is a big need for people to just understand the basics. The IB environments, what is in-game, around the game, away from the game? What is the behavior in those type of environments? And also, who are the audience behind it? Because to what... Um, Caitlin was talking about and Sasha was saying too, like half of the audience don't actually know they are gamers, mm. right? Over 50%, actually close to 60 to 70% of these casual gamers don't think of themselves as gamers. So what does that mean? And, and how do we actually drive outcomes in gaming environments will become quite nuanced. So to think about it from a, you know, if this is my very first campaign, don't dip your toes straight into the metaverse. Start with what you can actually prove, yep. effectiveness within in-game, around the game, such as some of the examples that Caitlin mentioned, right? Then if you want to start looking into how to drive advocacy, that's when you can start looking into away from the game with live streamers and then deeper engagement through game mods. But there are different, um, there are different stations that you can jump on and jump off at. And there are a lot of experts now that can actually help um, brands and marketers along the journey. So I think start by understanding the um, uh, environment, then the behavior and audience that you actually are after and aligning that to your outcomes. Yeah, that makes sense. That's excellently put. We, so we're referring there to a handbook sort of foundational output that we did last year with, with some definitions. That was sort of the starting point. And then the outputs will be a little more niche thereafter. Um, so feel free to go and do download um, that handbook. Um, now, in the, um, the, the insights from the survey that Nat um, presented, I have to admit this is my personal uh, error, maybe, but I, I sort of had an assumption. I was concerned around what the spend might look like um, just in the short term. We know that there's a little more austerity around, and I was wondering what it might look like, but it actually comes out pretty good. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, Sasha, to you, whether there is um, some aversion to um, experimenting with some of your clients in sort of newer environments or something a bit different? Or is that, or am I just wrong? <laughs> Plain wrong again. Oh, I like telling you you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I definitely think there's always going to be a little bit of um, conservative approach in terms of investing in new, in new channels and, and platforms. I think particularly we're seeing a um, spike again in the current economic um, climate. Mm -hmm. I do think that we are seeing a massive shift with our clients around proving the efficacy of things and they're asking more detailed questions around ROI on spend. Okay. So not only is that, you know, affecting test and learn budgets, but it's also affecting anything that sits in sort of upper funnel, you know, as much as we'd all love to really attribute brand advertising, it is really hard for any channel, not just gaming, but I think overall we are starting to see a more, I guess, rigor around how they sign off budgets. Um, I think we're seeing less of budgets just being cut. I do think that a lot of the market marketing science from the likes of Mark Ritson and things have actually landed and helped us weather as an industry um, this economic crisis a little bit better than we have historically and understanding that brands that invest during, um, you know, downturns are generally brands that do grow during that time. But there is definitely a much bigger sort of double click from, from our clients around proving the effectiveness, pr proving the return on investment yep. um, on any channel. But that makes it harder to get things across the line, such as gaming. Okay, so that's consistent with what, what we're seeing everywhere, really, yeah. which makes it feel like get the game opportunities are fairly on schedule. They're, they're, they're fairly standardized now. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, it's a, it's a good thing that it's not just for gaming. You yep. know, it's across the board. Um, but I also think that there's some amazing ways that we can actually prove the e efficacy around gaming yep. that allows us to, you know, answer those questions. It's just sometimes you've got to go further down the road with them in terms of what they'll get than just saying we should test some gaming. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Um, so look, to pull that a little further, Caitlin, in terms of the, the, the user experiences and the pos positive experience that we saw in some of the case studies, including... Um, Mabel in New York. What? Um, how can how can brands look to develop those positive user experiences? What other examples might you have? I think there's probably two pieces to gaming that 
have similarities to other channels and I would kind of liken it to some of that more kind of one-to-one -one experience environments that I think where these two pieces actually come to fruition very frequently in media planning. One is creative and the creative experience that you have within these environments. And the second, I think, is that value exchange. So I think from a creative perspective, you can't, always just slap on your TVC in these kinds of environments, similar to the likes of, you know, when you're putting your ads in social media, you know, the 30 second TVC doesn't work on a mobile, it's not gonna work on a mobile in game either. Um, and I think there's a really kind of, I guess, beautiful way that you can talk to audiences in those spaces that you really do miss out on if you don't have that kind of I guess, creative thought process behind where that experience is, um, is being consumed. The second part of creative as well is, you know, we've seen some examples um, in the case studies to date, but, you know, when you're thinking about city landscapes and billboards and when you're walking past it, you can't have really small copy or those kinds yeah. of things as well. It's just, it actually just provides a really negative user experience. But I think that, that, to go into the more kind of value exchange that's within gaming, I think, you know, we did speak to some of the experiences like your reward video and incentivized viewing and that kind of value exchange can go really broadly for high reach activity and yep. it can provide really positive affinity with your brand, but it can go into those depths of like, if you're ready to jump into the metaverse, you can have, you know, purchases and really unique experiences. I think, really, I think the, the value that you can expect to receive back from customers, you want to be able to provide that value back to them as yep. well. And it's got to be thought through, right? Because some Absolutely. of it's just interruptive and yes. annoying. Or yeah. some of it is a genuine value exchange. I know my son loves mm -hmm. it. Don't know whether that's the target audience necessarily, 12 year old boy, but, you know, it, it can work. Sometimes. They yeah. Are. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, so Emma, just, I mean, it's quite a general question, but what, what are you excited about in this space, um, generally for, if, for the, in the next, next say nine to 12 months, is there something that's particularly exciting you? It could be ad related or otherwise. That's very broad. I know. Um, you can talk about whatever you like, you see. Oh, wonderful. Um, look, you know, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't excited and it is a deeper dive, but if I wasn't excited into brands really looking into these sandbox style games, whether that be Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite, to build spaces. And I think where I'm excited about it is less so looking at an OPEX spend for marketing campaign where you're you know, hitting your marketing targets, but more the kind of increasing focus on these spaces being evergreen and being updated and being a virtual home for a brand in a way that at the moment websites or social media are and that's how they operate you know you follow your favorite brands Instagram page or whatever what I'm excited about is the way that audiences increasingly these young audiences are using these spaces so they're not only going to play they're going to hang out you know I used to call my friends on the landline talk to their dad or their mum or their brother trying to get through hold up the internet for a half an hour while I chatted after school these kids now they're going into Roblox they're going into Sun Silk City they'll play around in the blow dry bar for a bit and then they'll just hang out mm. and they'll talk and that's how they're communicating and that's how they're hanging out you know they're not doing what we used to do. So I think when what I'm excited about is brands looking at these spaces and going, yes, we're going to invest in them. And maybe we start off in a small investment. Maybe it's like a one quick speed run game. But maybe we have a longer term plan to build out and build out our map or build out our arena and add things to it monthly and add incentives and tie it back into social. And what's going on on Instagram? And, you know, what are the rewards we're giving, um, you know, users in games? And then how is that tying back in? I think... Gaming as a category offers opportunities for sort of integration and community in a way that we haven't really seen before. You know, even music's very one way, sports very one way. Gaming is community. At its very nature, it's community, and it's increasingly so. You know, again, the shift from going home, playing in your bedroom by yourself through a game, and a lot of people still do that. But for these up-and-coming generations, it is more about, you know, the conversation, the back and forth. So for me, what's exciting is... Brands that are looking at this not as a way to capture an audience to sell a product right now, 
but to capture an audience and give them back value and communicate with them over the next couple of years and being able to use, you know, a range of um, means to do so, media, in-game, you know, outside of game and so on and so forth, Discord, whatever it may be. So, yeah, that's that's what's sort of yeah, keeping me up answer. at night right now. It is so exciting to see what can be done. I mean, Roblox is obvious, but when you see kids let loose, just even, even in, like I've seen it in Fortnite with... My son and his, what they're actually getting up to is just ridiculous. They're hanging out on a Jeep, just doing ridiculous, they're not even shooting at anyone. They're just, they're just being hilarious. Exactly, just doing Brilliant. stunts or memes or whatever it may be. Yep, yep. No, it's, uh, it is wonderful. Um, so, Yoon, we're going to be a little more grown up now with our last question. I don't like being grown up. Sorry. <laughs> well, we've got to try sometimes, haven't we? Um, so, we saw in the research in terms of concerns that there is still um, that sort of Hang on. I wonder if it's always emotional baggage of what we've seen in the past. I certainly talk about that a lot. But in relation to, say, brand safety or suitability for brands, which has come up several times today, um, and even ad fraud. We recently released an ad fraud handbook. Download it, please. So just what, can, what more can be done? Or just what are, the, what are some of the just um, the, the 101s that we need to do in and around these issues to reassure brands? I think... Gaming as a channel is nuanced, right? But there's still marketing 101s. Like, cheap is cheap for a reason. The mm. number of times I've had um, brands or agencies go, oh, but the last time I did gaming, the fraudulent traffic, I was like, well, you asked a few questions, and they were expecting to have, you know, if they are doing around the game, they're expecting Angry Birds at bargain basement price. Yeah. So I think... These 101 principles around how to get quality inventory, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true, right? So there's that. Um, but I think around brand fraud, there are different ways in which you can um, apply technology, similar to how you would um, uh, apply it to programmatic campaigns. You can now run a lot of these um, brand safety as well as ad fraud measures um, into your gaming buy. So as an example, you could easily have the choice to, you know, have verification like Pixelate on our platform. Yep. So that's that. But I think something else that's also important is um, I had a conversation with Gay not so long ago around how do we actually grow gaming as a channel? And I think the conversations that we have today is great. We need to be able to show effectiveness and we need to be able to have technology to be able to show, okay, this is the brand lift that you're actually getting. This is the attention metric that you can now measure. Um, and I think all of these different things coming into play around measurability as well as effectiveness will be very key. And the experts on here will be able to share in terms of whether it's technology or whether it's just guardrails in place mm -hmm. um, to be able to showcase brands being able to have a successful gaming strategy, um, one that is brand safe, effective, and measurable. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's just, that's conventional. I mean, that's consistent with what we do with hopefully all, all buying, and it shouldn't shouldn't be any different. No, it shouldn't. Um, yep. There's just different ways in which you would do it. Yep. Yep. The yep. 101 is still the same. All right. Now, uh, I know we're a little bit over, um, stopping you from having uh, some refreshments, but are there any questions, Jen, that we might want to uh, throw out from Slido, or is there anyone in the room willing to ask a question and potentially win a Twitch T-shirt? Oh, Dom's going to do it now. You got, you got one on. Ah, <laughs> shirt off your back. Who's the question from? Anonymous. Oh. Is Gay going to win the T-shirt at this rate? Um, any bespoke metrics? Is there anything that stands out or is unique? Um, I think attention is an interesting one, only because like there are quite a number of formats that you can't actually engage in. Yep. So your time and view and the active attention as well as passive attention is very interesting in gaming. Yeah, and if you're smart, I can see Caitlin's thinking of an answer, because some of those immersive um, experiences... Traditionally in gaming, you'd end up actually almost hiding the ads. It used, used to annoy me, but that's got a lot better. So when you strike the balance, you'd think the viewability and attention data would be awesome. Yeah, exactly. I think there's also a little bit of education on, depending on what the experience is, but frequency. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you have a game where you might pass a billboard or you might be playing a football game and the bollards around the football field are all branded. Same as the frequency as you would expect playing, uh, sorry, watching a live game, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a high frequency. Um, and I think, you know, those metrics of what we would traditionally value as a good frequency for driving reach, frequency doesn't really impact reach in gaming. Right. Um, and I think that that's a metric that we do need to scrutinize a little bit to say, I'm comfortable with a frequency of 50 per lifetime. It's, yep. it's, it's, it's big, but it is also valuable. That makes sense, actually. Yep, uh, that's the sort of thing we'd want to weave into that planning document um, that, that we want to publish. Yeah, Christmas. I think, like, I think the attention piece um, is really interesting as well. I think, Caitlin, you've hit the nail on the head. Like any channel, there isn't just random metrics that we go, we always look at A, B and C. Mm. And, you know, there's probably some channels that you fall into that routine a little bit, but not only do we need to be looking at formats in the same way that you can be running video or static on Facebook, that if you start putting view through rates and not giving that context yep. is so important. And yep. we do it just out of basic understanding on other channels and it's taking that same marketing 101 to gaming. It's not this big, wild, crazy, I mean, it can be, mm. thing that is so, so far from what we actually do day to day in other channels. Um, and then just also really bringing it back to clients of having those mem measurement conversations at the start on every channel against what the objectives are. Because your measurement for something that is trying to look at a performance play versus something that is about brand or you know a much bigger impact is gonna be so different. And I think we, we need to be better at having those conversations at the start to help sell in what we're trying to do. Yep, fantastic answers. Well look, please give the panelists a massive round of applause. <laughs>